right, uh, 12.30. So uh, I think uh, today and Thursday we're going to be covering sort of the last uh, uh, topics on regression, on linear regression. And uh, today, literally, uh, what I need to do is uh, go 12.30 and 30 seconds late. Okay. Uh, so I basically want to go uh, through the, the type of uh, calculations you have to do for the next homework. So the next homework involves, uh, it's a real problem with lots of details, but if you do them right, you're going to learn a lot. All right? Now, we give you the program, and it is the first time that I offer the course that I give you the program. Because I realize I want to have at least one student by November, okay? Still in the glass, I bet. Okay? So we're going to give you the program, uh, which means the expectation is for you to put the calculations in the notes and what's in the program one-to-one. -one. And that is not necessarily trivial. So if the only thing you do is press return, I wish you the best, okay? Uh, we give you the program to actually see what is there how it has been programmed, what it means, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very comprehensive uh, uh, set of activities that does uh, practically everything you will do for research if your task is to use linear regression. Okay? Now, uh, the book, uh, this uh, uh, chapter uh, that I'm using is from uh, a book called uh, Bayesian Core, and we gave you the link to the chapter. Okay? Uh, when you look at the chapter, it's actually, you know, 20 pages. Uh, my notes are 95 pages. Why? Because I give you the proofs of what's in the notes. All right? Because you will realize when you read this book, yeah, it sounds wonderful. There's lots of n nice data. But in between, what do you do? So I give you the proofs. Okay? Uh, uh, a note. In every page of this chapter, there's about five mistakes. So you have to consult uh, the corrections for the uh, book, or you have to consult my notes. And if you see something wrong with the notes, uh, and I'm sure there must be some things that they are wrong, uh, you let us know. All right. So uh, literally, we're going to go from scratch to do everything related to this example, even if we have seen things, OK? and. Uh, because statisticians like Robert, sometimes they follow a non-Bayesian thinking. I'm going to throw that here and there, but I'm going to make it explicit what is uh, relevant to the class and what is not. All right. So uh, immediately I see the first typo. So we are going to uh, assume that uh, we want to construct basically a mapping from uh, x to y. I'm going to take y to be scalar, uh, x is a vector, okay? And uh, we're going to try to learn this mapping through a collection of data xi, yi, for i equal 1 to n, okay? That's our supervised learning uh, uh, regression problem. And I think in uh, the particular case, this is called the caterpillar uh, uh, example, because y is basically the size of the colony of the caterpillar, and x are different factors that affect uh, basically uh, the colony size. So these are lots of caterpillars, so hopefully you don't have those in your yard, or I don't have them in my yard, even though they're good for you, right? I suppose so. Everything is good for you. Okay. Uh, uh, some actually terminology that I have not used in statistics, this, the uh, input variables are called the explanatory variables or covariates, and Y is called the response function. Okay? In uh, the setting that we're going to do for uh, this homework, the input sections are assumed to be continuous, but actually you can set uh, regression problems where uh, these variable sets actually can be uh, discrete variables can be indicator functions or can be uh, some can be continuous some can uh, be discrete but in our case as we have done up to now everything would be continuous variables so uh, the particulars of the problem are not relevant right but what is relevant is that we have 10 inputs 
So this is not a trivial problem. All right. So when you try to run it in your PC, uh, be sure you charge, uh, you uh, leave your computer uh, charged all the time because it may take a few hours to actually get the results. Okay. It's not a toy problem. So the input is 10 dimensional, all right? And we want to build a mapping from these 10 dimensions to one. Uh, so actually one of the first problems uh, that is asking you is to plot uh, a, a log of y versus the inputs uh, x uh, individually. So this is y, log of y versus x1, log of y versus x2. And the idea is you're know, trying to see if you can learn anything as to what variables are important uh, for, your, uh, for predicting y. And it's actually very difficult to say, looking at this, you're going to have to think hard to say that x1 is really the most important variable, you know, uh, x9 is not. It's very difficult to say that. Okay? But we will see uh, when uh, we complete this assignment that effectively you don't really need all of these variables. Somehow, actually, you can get rid of lots of them because they don't influence Y. And somehow, we're going to have to learn this, and we will learn this doing model and variable selection. All right. Uh, you remember, it's, uh, uh, you know, the first thing you do when you do regression is build the design matrix. Uh, and in our case, uh, where it, so we have uh, K input variables. So our model, you know, the function will be some constant w0 plus w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus uh, wk plus 1, xk plus 1. So obviously, uh, you know, we have uh, 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 k variables plus the bias term, the constant term, so k plus 1, okay? So I am going to account for that explicitly. So this is uh, the design metrics that uh, I follow precisely the notation in, uh, in the Bayesian core book, so we don't have to, uh, to deviate from uh, the notation there. So the notation we use, sometimes we use this as capital X, all right? Some other times we use this as capital V, all right? So this is what's called the design uh, matrix. And um, uh, you can, uh, the only thing you need to remember the way that this is arranged, that effectively every row corresponds to one data point. This is sort of standard, okay? So, um, you know, this is point one, okay? So the, value, the values of these variables x1, x2, xk, for point one, this is x1, x1, x2, x1k, and this is at uh, uh, point a. And so the dimension of this matrix is n times k plus one, okay? Again, k variables, and we account for this one, uh, that is the bias term, so we have n times k plus one. All right. Um, uh, another notation change, we're going to do this, and I was thinking uh, this morning to change it, but maybe it will create confusion when you read the chapter. So we, for the regression model, we use W basically following uh, Bishop's notation. You remember when we wrote uh, the regression function, Y was uh, W transpose times basis functions V of X, okay? So the notation used in uh, the Bayesian core W corresponds to beta, which uh, uh, try not to get confused, right? We will see hundreds of these things today because beta usually we affiliate it with parameters. Well, you know, uh, W is a parameter, but uh, uh, so uh, these are the, the regression parameters. Okay, so this is the likelihood model given this matrix X, given the noise level. Uh, the probability of the y follows a Gaussian. So this comes from our regression function. This is the noise. This is sort of the standard thing that we discussed before. And uh, so the regression function is basically uh, x times beta. And you can see for a particular um, uh, yi, this is how the regression uh, response will look like. Okay, And uh, sigma squared is the noise. Okay. And uh, we will take it as unknown to start with, okay? And uh, all right, so we don't need this. I'm not going to tell you anything about that. So uh, obviously, if you take uh, uh, a constant uh, 
beta, so if the parameters are known, if uh, x is known, uh, the mean of yi, all right, is what you see here. This is by definition, this is our regression function, and the noise is sigma squared. Uh, and we're going to make uh, an assumption which is very common. We're going to assume that the number of data points we have is way more than k plus 1. Okay? And uh, so effectively, you remember this uh, x metric, matrix the way we had it? It had k plus 1 columns. So we're going to assume that those k plus 1 columns are basically independent. So the rank of x is k plus 1. Okay? So again, we have a few columns in the matrix X, okay, which is K plus one, uh, but the rows are way uh, more uh, equal to it. So this actually will guarantee that X transpose X that comes in the least squares uh, problem is uh, invertible. So the likelihood, uh, I can write it explicitly from there, it looks like that, okay? So uh, notation slightly different. You know, we use scripted L. So the likelihood is a function of the parameters, which is the uh, regression parameters and the noise. Okay, it's uh, this square exponential here, and this is from the normalization factor of the Gaussian. So uh, MLE estimate, which will be your first problem. All right, the MLE estimate. You're going to write down the log likelihood, and you're going to take derivatives with respect to the regression parameters. And this is our MLE estimate. You remember, it was exactly what we had before. Nothing new, okay? Um, all right, uh, now I am going to slightly be non-Bayesian, okay? I'm gonna, so I'm just putting a parenthesis. I'm going to be slightly non-Bayesian. We have done this calculation, but it's slightly uh, non-Bayesian, okay? So, uh, so this, so this, MLE estimate, right, says estimator is an estimator of the uh, regression parameters. So we would like to know uh, what is the distribution of that estimator uh, over data sets. That's why this is non Bayesian. Okay? So uh, notice the following this estimator is a linear function of the data y, and the data y from our likelihood model follows this distribution. In a Bayesian setting, right, y is fixed, that's it, nothing varies, this is it, a point estimate, done, okay? Now I'm going to become a little bit uh, uh, less Bayesian, and I say, well, look, y follows this distribution, so obviously my MLE estimate will follow some distribution which is uh, defined by this linear, by this matrix times y, so if y follows this, this estimator will actually follow this Gaussian distribution. And I put uh, with blue letters there, with blue coloring, the transformation uh, of the mean and the variance. Uh, uh, when I have, uh, here I have a linear transformation of y, right? So the mean will be this matrix times the mean of y, which is x times beta. And the variance will be the variance of y, which is sigma squared i, times this times, uh, uh, you know, this transpose. You see that? You remember how you transform the mean? You multiply by the metrics, but, uh, you know, uh, the transformation of the variance will be this matrix times that matrix transpose, and this is what you get. Okay? So when you simplify this, you immediately show, see that uh, if you play over data sets, the MLE estimate follows a Gaussian distribution with mean the exact mean, because the MLE estimator is an estimator of beta, the parameters, all right? So that's the exact beta. And the variance is sigma squared x transpose x inverse. So again, in a sort of non-Bayesian setting, if you play over data sets, uh, the estimator, the distribution of the estimator is a Gaussian around the exact estimate and has this noise level. I'm writing this explicitly. And, you know, as uh, it actually shows here, this is the best estimator, linear estimator that you can get. In the sense that any other linear estimator will give you more variance, okay? Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing you notice is that the mean of this estimator is the exact uh, uh, beta, which means that this estimator is unbiased. 
Okay? Again, I am giving you this, this is a, in a non-Bayesian setting, right? So some court on the first problem in the homework, you're going to have to plot some confidence intervals for this estimator. So effectively, what you will need to look is at this distribution that you see up there. OK? All right. Uh, similarly, if you take the log likelihood, OK, so if we go, well, it's here. If you take the log likelihood, uh, we took derivatives with respect to beta. We got the MLE estimator for beta. You can also take derivatives with respect to sigma square, and you get this MLE estimate. Right? Which is exactly what we had before. There is nothing new. We're repeating basically what we have seen in uh, several times for, for Bayesian regression. Uh, this is uh, the MLE estimate for uh, these uh, noise variants. So now, um, and I'm not going to do the algebra because uh, you are not, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're going to be lost if we concentrate on the little proofs there in the nodes. Uh, somebody will ask you, well, look, I see a y there. Y follows a distribution. So can you tell me what's actually the mean of this estimator and what's the variance? So effectively, what you will need to do is, you know, you have to take the expectations of this, and you have to take the variance over the distribution of, of the data set, y. All right? You remember y follows this distribution. So if y follows this distribution, what's the distribution that this estimator follows? OK? Yes? No? Again, right, if in a Bayesian setting you get an estimator, done, because there's only one y, and that's it. But in a non-Bayesian setting, you say, look, if I play with data sets, y comes from a distribution. So there is, if I change y, I'm going to get something else. So you're asking, what's the mean value of this estimator? What's the variance of that estimator? OK? And again, the mean and the variance with respect to this distribution of the data. OK? So uh, what you will need to do is you basically start taking the mean of this and the variance of that, um, follow some linear algebra, and I give you all the nodes. And I'm going to give you the answer. The answer comes that the expectation of the MLE estimator is sigma squared, the exact variance, divided by n times n minus k minus 1. OK? Um, it's interesting, right? So you, you remember the, the rank of that matrix x was k plus 1. Uh, but we had n rows, so here what we, you know, we had n equations, but now we have n minus k minus 1, okay? Uh, and uh, obviously, this is not equal to sigma square. So if you actually want to make this unbiased, this would be an unbiased estimate, okay? So 1 over n minus k minus 1 times uh, this error that your uh, regression model does from the given data y. Does this equation remind you anything about, for example, the MLE estimate of a, of a Gaussian? What's the unbiased estimate of the variance of a Gaussian? One over? Uh, n minus one. N minus one. So can you think the relation, uh, I keep forgetting to put the microphone on. Can you think now, there we had, n minus 1, now we have n minus k minus 1. Why n minus k minus 1 now? You remember when we did the, the MLE estimate for the Gaussian, we said the interpretation was that one degree of freedom was taken to fix the mean, the MLE of the mean. So here, k plus 1 degrees of freedom were taken to fix what? The MLE of beta, which has how many parameters, has k plus 1. All right? So effectively, uh, this is from where this 1 minus k minus 1 comes. Uh, the algebra is given in the previous slides. I strongly advise you to look, all right? But uh, this is the unbiased estimate for the variance, 1 over n minus k minus 1. And I define uh, y minus x beta, transpose y minus x beta, this square error, uh, around the, the, the uh, predictions 
using the MLE beta, all right? I define this as S squared. So remember, because this is going to come up in uh, some fundamental identities that we have seen before, uh, and you will see once more, S squared is this uh, error that you do in your regression model when you fix the parameters of the MLE estimate, uh, so the error that you do from the actual measurements one. All right? And uh, if you uh, take the, uh, the variance, so this thing with the hat is the unbiased estimator, right? So this is the MLE estimator. From there, we get this unbiased estimator. So if you uh, compute uh, the variance of that, uh, hopefully I have it somewhere. Well, I don't have it. Let me see if I have it. OK. Uh, if I have the, um, so we need to know the, um, what slide is, 14. All right, so I don't have it because obviously we would not need it in this homework. OK, so uh, basically this is, this is uh, this, uh, 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 the MLE estimator. That's the result that we will use. All right, so uh, you remember the, uh, I, before on the previous slide, I saw that the MLE estimate of beta follows a Gaussian around the exact beta and, and this noise level. So you may say, what do I use on this noise level if I want to get error bars on the MLE estimate for beta? What you will do is you will use actually the unbiased estimator of sigma square. So effectively, the calculation here, you are going to use sigma bar or sigma what's that hat. Okay, so what I'm saying is, if I ask you to give me error bars on the MLE estimate for the coefficients around the exact uh, beta, you need to know sigma square, and the way you will do that is you will approximate this sigma square using the unbiased estimate of sigma square. Okay, so you will see this previous formula that I had where sigma square is sigma hat square. All right, uh, I give you the proofs of these things so you can actually follow them. And uh, uh, I'm going to throw a little bit of uh, non Bayesian uh, uh, statistics here. Uh, if you're not interested, you just do it mechanically in the homework using the formulas that they are there. Uh, otherwise, they are not of significant value. Uh, so, in um, so a lot of times, uh, you define what's called the sampling distribution of the MLE, okay? And the sampling distribution of the MLE, uh, so you notice here, it looks like the distribution of the MLE is a Gaussian, all right? But actually, you know what? Um, if you think about it, because sigma square there is, is, uh, uh, is a random variable, right? Sigma square has its own distribution. We just fix it to sigma hat. Actually, to really get the uh, sampling distribution of the MLE, you have to get rid of sigma square. And what type of distribution you get when you integrate sigma square out on, uh, from Gaussians? So when you take an infinite mixture of Gaussians, you get the student T distribution. So the sampling distribution of the MLE, uh, and we will do this you know, in a Bayesian setting later today or on uh, Thursday, it is uh, a student t distribution. So if you look at a, a given parameter beta i, so you define the statistic, the t statistic of the MLE estimate as beta i, that's the MLE estimate minus the true, divided by this noise parameter. So this is the unbiased uh, MLE estimate. And wii is the diagonal ii element of x transpose x inverse. So you can show that this is uh, follows a t-distribution, and uh, you can uh, use this, and maybe some of you have used it, to do hypothesis testing. So if you want, for example, to test if beta i equal to zero, and you call this uh, hypothesis h0 versus a hypothesis h1 where beta i is not equal to zero, you can actually show that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you select a level uh, alpha, to test your hypothesis, you can show that this is the cumulative distribution of the student t uh, 
so you can show that this equation, if this equation is satisfied, then you accept the hypothesis that beta I equal to zero. And you may say, why do I care about all of these things? You haven't said anything about non-Bayesian statistics. Well, statisticians, you know what they will do? They will check if this is satisfied for a given level alpha, and if it is satisfied, they will take the parameter beta i to be equal to zero. So they say it's not important for doing uh, predictions of y. And uh, so in a, in a sort of, uh, uh, again, I'm going to throw something that uh, I really dislike teaching you about. But you may ask, OK, this is going to, uh, I'm going to be able to show you this actually in a Bayesian setting that under some limited circumstances, we're actually going to get the same result. But uh, for those who have seen this before, you may ask, from where is this thing comes that you accept a zero uh, for beta i to be equal to zero when this is satisfied? And the answer is, is coming from the p-values. So, um, so if you calculate the p-values all right, uh, to a certain level alpha, you can show that you accept or reject the hypothesis h zero uh, in a criteria that basically is the same as what we have here. And uh, so in the homework, the only thing you have to do is to actually, you don't even have to do it because it's already programmed. You have to verify that this formula is there. Uh, and uh, this formula would be one way to test if a particular variable beta is, uh, is essential in your regression model or not, OK? And there will be many criteria in, in this homework that you'll be using, but this is a non-Bayesian way using this t-statistic. So uh, if you want to reject that it's zero, basically at the level alpha, what you need to do is uh, compute this cumulative CDF for student t at uh, this statistic, okay? And if it's greater than one minus half over two, then you reject that it's zero. All right. Uh, I promise that somehow I am going to show you this equation being completely derived from Bayesian, a Bayesian perspective way later on uh, in the notes uh, today uh, or on Thursday. Okay? So if it doesn't mean anything, it's okay. We will come back on a Bayesian setting. All right, so what, uh, uh, one of the things you will have to plot, and it's already actually in, in the computer program, uh, you are going to have to calculate this uh, uh, MLE estimate, beta i, you're going to have to calculate this noise level, you're going to have to calculate this statistic t, and then the p-values, okay? And uh, uh, you notice here, so these are the different variables, all right? Because you have, uh, how many we have, uh, I don't know, obviously here it shows 11 variables, all right? Look at these p-values, for those who know anything about p-values, why are these things marked with star? What does that mean? So you are checking here if the statistic t is greater than that, all right? And these probabilities are coming to be very small here, uh, less actually than 0 0.05, because that's what I'm taking alpha. Uh, but some other uh, probabilities are way bigger than 0 0.05. So can you guess what those stars mean? So obviously, these probabilities are less than uh, the level alpha that you have selected for your uh, p-test, which means the hypothesis that these betas are 0 are uh, rejected for this case, this case, this case, and that case, which means these variables that you see with star are very important. The rest of the variables, you can actually get rid of them. OK? So a, 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 a statistician uh, who doesn't know anything about Bayesian things, this is what it will use to actually decide which variables are effective in the regression model. OK? And this is the only reason I'm just telling you, because sort of this is a starting point, but it's completely non-Bayesian. I mean, certain journals will not accept this calculation. OK? So if these probabilities are less than 0 0.5, 0 0.05, uh, then the hypothesis that these coefficients are 0 is failing. And you can see these cases here. Uh, so this seem to be essential uh, uh, input variables for the regression model. 
and we will test this when we do the Bayesian case. All right, uh, now we are going to continue with uh, uh, becoming Bayesian again. All right, so this is our likelihood. All right, I am going to give you uh, a very handy uh, rewriting of this likelihood equation but you may want to keep notes because in a lot of books and papers it is written as the starting point. So you notice here you have y minus x times beta, all right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I, by manipulation of this uh, uh, term here, x times beta, I am going to introduce the MLE estimate by uh, putting minus the MLE estimate of beta plus the MLE estimate of beta, and then with some simple algebra, I am going to rewrite the likelihood uh, similarly to what I had before, but I'm going to create this error, quadratic error term that involves y minus x beta bar. All right? So this is the, the, the MSC error, the square error, but using the MLE estimate of the parameters to estimate how close you are to y. Okay, so if you remember S squared equals what you see here. So this has two terms. It has this defined completely with the MLE, and this is how far away uh, this uh, beta is from the actual beta. I mean, obviously, if I take expectations, right, uh, this thing will drop out, okay, because the expectation of beta hat is equal to beta. But uh, right now, this is a good way to rewrite uh, uh, the likelihood Okay, uh, and because it will facilitate our algebra. I know this was somewhere in passing in earlier slides. I never gave you this expression, so you may want to keep notes. It's simple algebra, uh, adding and removing basically the MLE estimate, and this is what you get. All right, so we're going to do Bayesian, so we need to have a prior for the uh, uh, parameters, the regression parameters, and, and the noise. And uh, we already know that the model is going to be Gaussian inverse gamma. Okay, I did this in the lecture on uh, uh, last Friday uh, as well. So basically, our priors will consist: given sigma squared beta will follow Gaussian. Here I'm writing the the order of the Gaussian. The dimensionality is k plus one, right? This is how many parameters I have. Uh, so this curly beta is the mean of the prior. Let's be clear on the notation. Beta hat is the MLE estimate. The curly beta is the mean of the prior. And then I am putting uh, this uh, positive met definite matrix M here, M minus 1. That's going to be a parameter of the model times sigma square. So beta given sigma square is this Gaussian. And then for sigma square, I put an inverse gamma with parameters A and beta. OK? Uh, it's practically the same thing we had before, okay? The annotation only looks, uh, maybe here I had something else, and here something else, uh, uh, another symbol, but apart from that, they're exactly the same. So what you do is you take the likelihood, which is written in this form that I explained before, you multiply this with this Gaussian, there it is, you multiply this with this inverse gamma distribution, there it is, uh, and the reason you type these equations is when you type, things fit together. If you write this by hand, you'll be in need of uh, a very long notebook, all right, to correct for all your mistakes. But when you write them here and you correct it, okay, you get the posterior. And the posterior is going to be of what form? Because these are conjugate priors. Right? This is conjugate priors to the Gaussian likelihood. So the posterior will be, will be Gaussian inverse gamma. Correct. So uh, I am. Uh, uh, so I'm going. You know, I'm not going to uh, go through again through the algebra, right? But somewhere in passing, I am going to tell you a trick that I think it escaped us uh, because I was uh, emphasizing the closing the square type of calculation. But I am going to tell you another trick that is used in this book. Uh, that is extremely useful uh, to close the square, but doing it differently, okay? So let me see what the results that are coming out. What you see here, uh, again, this, this massive calculation is basically the product of all the terms, so it is really a Gaussian inverse gamma. 
So if you take in this calculation sigma squared to be constant, all right? So if you fix sigma squared, what actually you get is you get the conditional of beta given sigma squared, and the conditional of beta given sigma squared, it's this Gaussian that you see here. It's actually directly looked if you fix sigma square, uh, you know, and if you keep only the terms that involve uh, beta, it comes out that the conditional of beta given sigma square is this Gaussian. So the mean of beta is this, which is a nice formula because you remember the mean of beta now is a weighted average uh, of this beta. What is this beta? It's the mean of the prior, and what is this beta? The MLE estimate, okay? So you see immediately you have a weighted average, all right, where this matrix M and X transpose X come, but it's a weighted average of the two estimates, and then the variance looks like that. But keep in mind, okay, this calculation here is the conditional of beta given sigma squared, okay? So if you go here and you fix sigma squared, this is what you get. Now, uh, if you, uh, uh, to get now, I'm not going to give you the algebra, okay? I just, I'm going to go directly to the final formula. If you want to get the distribution of sigma square alone, you're going to have to integrate beta out, okay? And the way you are going to integrate beta out, you are going to close the square here so that beta will be forming a Gaussian that you can integrate it out. And whatever is left, that will be the marginal distribution of sigma square. And the marginal distribution of sigma square, uh, at the end of the day, let me see if the next slide has it, the marginal distribution of sigma square comes to be this uh, wonderful inverse gamma distribution. Okay? So, again, the marginal distribution of sigma square comes to be this. Okay? There's no beta anywhere involved. We integrate it out. Okay? And you can see immediately uh, the posterior mean uh, using the formulas for the inverse gamma distribution is this nice quantity here. Okay? Um, you can compute the variance, you can compute anything you want to. So, um, if somehow you need to calculate those things, basically you can extract this from uh, this distribution. All right. All right, so I'm going to uh, let me uh, simplify uh, things to see if they look familiar. So if you take the prior mean to be zero, and if you take that matrix M to be uh, the identity matrix divided by some positive constant C, so actually you can take the mean of the conditional of beta given sigma square, and you can you know, plug in the two values there, and immediately uh, the expectation of beta, condition of sigma square, comes to be this, okay? And does this formula remind you anything? Basically, this is regularized least squares, isn't it? Precisely. All right? And actually, this is what people call uh, rich regression, basically, in uh, statistics and in uh, linear algebra. Okay? So if you use m to be this, and the prior mean to be 0, you basically get uh, regularized least squares. Okay? And it's important, again, this is the, est the expectation of beta given sigma square. All right? Uh, if you want now the, uh, the probability of beta, not condition of sigma squared, but the probability of beta, the marginal one, what you will need to do is you will need to do a very serious calculation where you integrate sigma squared out, and uh, uh, to integrate sigma squared out, you're going to have to follow uh, the probability of sigma squared given the data, and the probability of sigma squared given the data is this inverse gamma distribution. So you have a horrendous calculation to do, all right? So you have this conditional distribution, which I gave you the form, times this, which is an inverse gamma. So when you put them together, you can actually perform this marginalization and get the probability of beta, the marginal, precisely. And you may say, how do I do all these integrals? I'm not very good at those things. You know what I do when I do this type of calculations? I go to the computer and I say, find me a symbolic integrator, and I put the different symbols. So I say, you know what, okay, call this alpha, call this beta, etc., and tell me what the answer is about the integral. And surprise, surprise, when it does, right, there is the answer, uh, and it comes out uh, when you do everything together. Uh, uh,
come on, give me the final answer, it comes out as expected that the uh, marginal uh, of beta follows a student T distribution, which is not surprising, right? You remember the beta given sigma square was a Gaussian, and now we average over all possible variances, obviously it would be a student T distribution, so the student T distribution comes to be a wonderful formula, it's uh, dimensionality k plus 1, has degrees of freedom n plus 2a. a, you remember, comes from that prior that we had on sigma squared. And it has mean and variance indicated here, all right, with this uh, otherwise uh, uh, complicated looking formulas. But if you think about it, actually, these formulas look extremely sort of uh, computationally easy to handle. They're not like, you know, if somebody tells you, go and compute this marginal, you say, I cannot compute it, you know, I can only approximate it. Well, that's not good enough. If there is an analytical solution, approximations are not good, okay? And for these problems, there is an analytical expression, okay? And, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, if you want to program this, it's one line calculation because if you know the answer, Basically, it's all manipulations of this student T distribution with this mean and this covariance, and that's it. All right, and I summarize for you the student T distribution. I think somewhere I put an, a, a note because I am following uh, the notation from the Bayesian core book. Sometimes when you write a student T, uh, you put the dimensionality as a parameter and you put as a subscript here, the degrees of freedom, all right? This is what I have uh, actually, um, where is uh, the notation for this? You notice here, uh, the degrees of freedom is the subscript, right? And sometimes the dimensionality, you put it inside. Uh, the textbook has it the other way around, but obviously, beta is of dimensionality k plus one, so there's no way you can get confused, okay? So don't get confused with, uh, the switching, the arguments, basically they are the same. It's a, just a different way of writing it. All right. Uh, we're not done yet, all right? Because somebody will say, uh, so we computed the marginal posteriors, we computed the conditional posteriors, uh, everything. What is missing to complete the Bayesian picture? What calculation is necessary to say we're done? So we train the model basically, right? We computed all the procedures of all the parameters. What's the next step to really be truly Bayesian after you train the model? You have to test it. So you need to compute, uh, given some new inputs x, curly x, and I don't just have one input, I give you a whole new matrix of axes that I call it x curved. What is the probability of the responses which I call curly y? All right, so the notation here again, right, is both y and uh, both x were the training outputs and inputs. Now I want for some, if I know the training, uh, the test inputs, I know, I want to know what's the probability of the test outputs. Okay, so um, uh, let me see, I, I, you know, I have to be careful here because I promise I will, I, I was going to show you a little trick, but, uh, it's extremely uh, useful calculation to know, okay? So, um, all right. Uh, so let me, so what I'm gonna do is, you know, what I am going to, uh, uh, to make life easy, I am go I'm gonna look at this formula to start with, okay? And you notice I'm gonna do predictions of this curly y, but given sigma square. So I'm gonna take the conditional predictions if I knew the noise. Obviously, we will eventually need to integrate the noise, but if I knew the noise, all right, the predicted distribution would be this likelihood times this posterior, and you notice both the likelihood and the posterior are conditioned on sigma square. You remember the predicted distribution, right, is the integral over the parameters of the likelihood times the posterior, but here I compute this by integrating only beta out, I condition on sigma square. I'm going to do this one step at a time. I'm not going to integrate on beta and integrate on sigma squared all at the same time, right? So what we're going to do is uh, get rid of beta here in the predictive distribution. So this 
will give us the predicted distribution condition on sigma square. Okay, and it says on the bottom we will later on integrate sigma square to compute uh, this. This is what we're really interested. But right now I'm going to try to compute that. All right, I'm going to show you the trick now that you have never seen before, and it's very essential. Okay. So look at those two generic identities, have nothing to do with regression, and tell me if you understand them. The only thing I don't show you in those identities is uh, with what, uh, what's the argument on each expectation, so you will have to look carefully and imagine. So here I have the expectation of x condition on z, and you notice somehow here I bring a y also, and I have the expectation of x condition y and z. Okay? So, uh, can you tell me, when I write this, accept them that this identity are true, okay? When I write the expectation inside, is the expectation with respect to what variable? It, I'm conditioning on y and z, so this obviously has to be an expectation with respect to what variable? Cannot be with respect to y and z, right? Because I condition those, so it's the expectation with respect to x. So once I get rid of x, this other expectation is conditioned on what? It's with respect to what variable? Because you notice the overall thing is still conditioned on z, as z is fixed. So it's conditioned on this is expectation with respect to? The outer is an expectation with respect to? To y. Because x already took expectations, I'm done with x. You see that? And uh, if you don't believe me, you can actually, I am writing, uh, I have you a proof here, okay? So the idea here is, right, if you want to find, um, here I mean I generalize by putting an, a conditional expectation, right? So I can completely get rid of the z. So I can uh, simply say, for example, that if I want to compute the expectation of x, maybe it's easier to compute the conditional expectation of x given y, all right? And it, once I do that, then I have to take expectations with respect to y. So find first the expectations given y, and then average over y. That's what this formula says. And the reason, again, when do we use this? When this conditional distribution is way easier to compute than computing this direct. So if you condition something, maybe the answer is immediate, right? But once you take that answer, then you have to average with respect to y. So that's one formula. And the same uh, uh, extension of this to variance, basically, the, this is the variance uh, uh, decomposition formula, extremely important. It says if you want to find the variance, let's forget the z, okay? Let's not pay attention on z, because I can condition on anything, okay? So this z here is not important. So it says the variance of x is the variance of the expectation of x given y, all right? And the expectation of the variance of x given y. So let's concentrate here. I am taking here expectations with respect to what? With respect to x, and then I'm taking variance with respect to what? Y. Similarly here, I take the variance with respect to x, and then I take expectations with respect to y. Again, when do I use these formulas? When these conditional expectations and variances are way easier to compute than computing directly the, the quantities on the left-hand side. And I'm going to convince you uh, by uh, doing this calculation on the previous slide, OK? So basically, here, what we need to do is condition on sigma squared. We need um, to uh, compute this integral. Uh, can you tell me what type of distribution this is? Remind me. So the parameters beta are known, and sigma squared is known. What distribution is the first? This immediately is a likelihood term, right? What distribution is this? This thing, the first term, what distribution is? If you know the regression parameters, you know the noise, and for a given input, what's the output? What distribution follows? The likelihood model. What distribution the likelihood, uh, what distribution the output follows? 
if I give you the input, this uh, x curly, and I give you all the parameters, what distribution the y follows? What, what type of distribution is it? Uh, oh, Gaussian. It's what? Gaussian. It's a Gaussian, right? It's a well, Gaussian likelihood. And uh, uh, you remember the distribution of beta given sigma square? Uh, what distribution was that? Social Gaussian. I computed it before, okay? So, uh, and so you have a Gaussian times a Gaussian, and then I integrate in beta. You know what the answer is going to be? It's going to be a Gaussian. So here is the idea. Rather than performing this by uh, forming the square in beta and then marginalizing, you know, getting rid of the normalization factor, the Gaussian in beta, I am going to use the trick that I showed you before to actually compute the mean and the variance of this distribution. And so let's see how this trick is going to work. Okay? Don't panic, okay? The, because this calculation will be way faster than uh, completing the square. So we really want to find the mean of this distribution, correct? All right? And similarly, we want to find the variance of this distribution. So what I'm going to do is I am going to use the first formula first for the mean, this one. So look at this and tell me exactly what am I doing on the first line. To compute that, I'm going to find first the, the, uh, the, the mean of some conditional distribution, all right? And the, I'm conditioning here on what? On beta, all right? So basically, the first expectation will be with respect to what distribution? So you know, I have two expectations here, right? So I'm conditioning here with respect to uh, beta. So the first expectation with will be with respect to what? This is be the expectation of what? Given beta, the expectation of with respect to what variable? Y, the scarcely Y. And then once I am done and there is no Y, the next expectation will be with respect to what variable? The beta. OK? All right. So I am doing this calculation. And um, uh, uh, you know what is the expectation of y, this curly y given beta? It is x curly times beta. From where is that coming? You remember our regression function was, you know, the prediction y is x times beta plus noise. The mean is x times beta. Right? The mean. I mean, our likelihood model says curly y equal x curly times beta plus the noise, which is that Gaussian sigma square variance. Okay? So the mean is x curly times beta. Okay? So, uh, and then what I need is the expectation of beta given sigma square and, and uh, the rest. And that is the distribution that we had before, which was a Gaussian. So I am copying the formula. So there is the mean of this conditional predictive distribution. And you do exactly the same thing for the variance of the predictive distribution. So you write it as the expectation of the conditional variance and the variance of the conditional expectation. And there is the answer. And there is, in uh, conclusion, uh, the Gaussian that gives you the predictive distribution. So once you train the model, Okay? This again, condition on sigma square. We only got rid of beta. Okay? So condition on, beta squ on, uh, on sigma square. This is a Gaussian that has this mean and has this covariance. Okay? Uh, if you don't like this derivation of this slide, okay, uh, you can go and close the square. It will take you about five pages. All right, close the square, normalize. But this is a very nice trick. If you know that something is Gaussian, Ask yourselves, can I find the mean and the variance? If the answer is yes, the calculation was probably would follow what you see here. And, and there is the answer. You would say it's a Gaussian. Um, M here is how many? Uh, M is the, uh, the number of uh, input x curl uh, input points that I have. Okay? This is the number of test points that I want to compute the response. All right, we are uh, not uh, done. Okay? So, uh, so this is 
So uh, this is conditional on sigma squared, okay? And now we need to integrate sigma squared out. And to integrate sigma squared out, the sigma squared, the marginal posterior of sigma squared follows this inverse gamma, all right? It was a horrendous formula that I gave you before. So basically, you have to perform now uh, uh, a, an integration in sigma squared of this Gaussian that we computed on the previous slides, slide plus this inverse gamma, all right? Um, and what is the answer going to come when you, so you sum here infinite Gaussians with different covariance sigma squared. So what's the answer going to be for the predictive distribution? A student T, okay? Hopefully you guys will remember this. Uh, so if you do a student T distribution, basically there is a wonderful answer, all right? Everything fits in these nice formulas. So it's, uh, 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 an m-dimensional student t distribution with m plus 2a degrees of freedom. This mean, uh, this uh, uh, variance, and basically these are the exact answers. And uh, so effectively, uh, if this comes in, uh, in the, uh, you know, in your calculations, you will see immediately these formulas. And I want you basically to make a connection. And I think once you see this in the computer program, and, and you see this uh, derived in the notes, you basically realize that this is not chemistry or alchemy, okay? I don't want to put down chemistry, okay? So basically, these are exact formulas, and, and effectively, if you uh, come up with the answer, the only thing the computer will care is that, what, that this is a student t distribution with these parameters that you give them, all right? Remember x and, uh, is from the training data, x curve is your test data, and uh, comes from the prior, this is the MLE estimate, this is the prior uh, mean, etc. Okay, and um, so you can uh, actually uh, simplify all of these things for different selection of the parameters, okay? So, um, um, so this was, you know, I suppose this is going to be an example, right? So, um, uh, so the prior basically looks like this, okay? This is M, there's a sigma square there, okay? Um, and uh, so uh, he's taking a particular case where the mean of the prior is equal to zero. Uh, the matrix M is the identity matrix divided by some constant C. So basically, uh, this, uh, this distribution here looks like that, okay? And then he sets, for the inverse gamma, he says some parameters A and B in the implementation, okay? And, uh, uh, and he runs the program basically to see how it behaves, okay? And I'm going to show you some results, all right? But what I basically want to point uh, right now is, uh, you notice here that, so, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is our prior model, and really the only thing that is left is that constant C. And the question would be, so the intuition here, as it says, is that if C is very large, all right, uh, this prior is very diffused, all right? So what do you expect, basically, that as if C is very large, that effectively the effect of the prior is not significant? Because it tells you you can be anywhere. Well, what you will see, and this is very important uh, in the real uh, sort of implementation of Bayesian models, you think that uh, this, the larger the C, you know, the more uh, uninformed this prior will be. But actually, as you will see, the effect of C is very significant in the predictions. Okay, so somehow you have to be very careful when you do these things because uh, uh, you will see on these tables, for example, uh, there are different estimates of, uh, uh, actually, this is the mean and the variance of the parameter beta zero. All right, so this is the posterior mean and the posterior variance from the formulas before, and these are the values for different values of C, from very small to very large, and you notice uh, how the expectation of the bias term uh, changes, okay, and uh, how the variance changes. So when uh, the concept that this is an uninformed prior, it's actually not true, okay? This prior is very informed, even if C is very large. 
Now, uh, if I continue the table, and maybe you want to play in the computer program, uh, if you keep putting C bigger and bigger, you will see sort of there is some convergence there. All right, you're going to reach. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be an asymptotic, but you know, basically you will uh, reach some certain value and you will oscillate around it. Okay, but basically going from C equal 10 to 100 to 1,000, the changes are significant. So, which means uh, that this sort of a prior that we've laid up to now for doing re regression models. So, and remember, this is a conjugate prior. Even when you push it to the limit of becoming uh, an uninformed prior by taking the variance to go to infinity, in reality, uh, the effect of the prior still remains. It's not uninformed at all. Okay? It's not uninformed at all. All right? Uh, so, th this, uh, uh, so this is the uh, uh, results, basically, for the coefficients that you get. These are these, uh, uh, th for the different coefficients, this is the posterior mean, the posterior variance for the different betas, okay? And um, um, so we said the values of C is uh, there, uh, and, and I, the program that you have does not play with the uh, parameters A and B in the inverse gamma, but I can tell you the dependence on this uh, coefficients A and B is also very significant. So really, this is not very good. These conjugate priors se seem to be nice to do algebra and get wonderful answers, but they're not really the best way of doing things. So what do we do? Uh, we're going to introduce uh, another prior, and we're going to start with uh, uh, informative prior, but uh, and then we're going to, to push it to an informative limit, and this prior is called the Zellner's uh, informative G prior. Okay, and it looks like this. What is different? Look at these equations. I think I mentioned passing on uh, Friday. Uh, what is from the generic forms? What is different here? Tell me all the differences from our uh, conjugate prior that we discussed before. First, what do you see here? What did we have here before? Here I did not have x transpose x inverse. What did we have before? I don't want to go back, you know, many slides, right? Uh, what did we have before? There. We had that matrix M, okay? And remember, sigma squared was an inverse gamma. So what do I have now? Instead of uh, that m inverse, what do I have? X transpose x inverse. So immediately, I, and I mentioned this on Friday, this sounds sort of uh, illegal. Because you have a prior that depends on the data. But you notice it only depends on the input data, not the output data. It only involves the uh, x inputs, right? This is the, the design matrix involves only the x inputs, OK? Uh, so that m matrix is really x transpose x here. And then for sigma square, rather than using uh, an inverse gamma distribution, we use an improper Je Jeffries prior that you did in your homework, which is 1 over sigma square. OK? So, uh, and, uh, so two differences up to now. The matrix here is not m. It's x transpose x. This is an improper prior now, sigma minus 2. And the other difference is I introduced directly that constant c uh, that we played before, right? So there is a constant c there, OK? And you can actually, uh, in the calculations, most probably I would need to do on, uh, on Thursday, uh, that coefficient c, we're going to make it an integer, OK? And we're going to do some magic about that coefficient to push this to the uninformative limit. But right now, this is how these equations look like. All right? Um, so why doing this? All right? It comes out when you finish the calculations and you compute uh, the posteriors. So basically repeating literally the same algebra we did before. You can actually take the formulas before and sort of uh, uh, change the notation and, and put the symbols there. Uh, it will come up that effectively, uh, uh, this uh, uh, coefficient c plays the role of um, uh, prior measurements. So basically, because of this format here, 
x transpose x inverse, when you combine this with the likelihood models, right, you're going to be getting that this prior corresponds to a given number of uh, dummy measurement data points. OK, so uh, I don't know if it says here. Uh, so basically, it tells you how much uh, information are you bringing uh, relative to the sample all right, by using this prior. OK, and, and I will show you. Oh, here it is. OK, so if you use uh, 1 over C to be 0.5, this comes to be equivalent, this is amazing, to 50% of your sample uh, data size. All right. So if you have, let's say, uh, you know, ten data uh, points, okay, using one over C equal to 0.5 is equivalent to using uh, five uh, data points, basically, as prior. You remember some of the priors, especially when uh, we were discussing about the exponential family. They are the priors that have this nice meaning that somehow prior counts. You remember, we did this for the binomial distribution, etc. So this coefficient c will come to be handy, OK? And, uh, and it will give us a nice interpretation of the results. But really, that's not the reason we are using it. Uh, you're going to use this in your homework, because this actually will make the predictions very good. All right, so what do you need? Uh, I'm only going to give you the formulas, because they are identical to the sort of the formulas before. They are uh, uh, more simplified, because of the form, uh, because of this uh, term here, the, all the results are uh, simpler uh, to look at. So the conditional of beta given sigma square, so this is the condition posterior is this Gaussian, all right? So immediately you can see uh, uh, that this C plays the role of weights between the prior mean and the MLE estimate, okay? Uh, this thing here has uh, uh, simplified as well. Uh, you can, uh, uh, again, this uh, marginal posterior of sigma squared is an inverse gamma. Uh, uh, exactly the same form as before. There is a simplification of the coefficient. The marginal of uh, beta is a student t distribution. I'm just copying basically the formulas from before. Okay, it looks like this. Okay, uh, and you notice x transpose x inverse comes. Uh, outside, and then you have all of this uh, factor on the front. And, um, and uh, uh, if you want the marginal of uh, the parameters beta, this is actually the most important quantity for uh, your homework, right? This is the marginal posterior. It's a student t distribution. There's no sigma square everywhere. So this is, so if you want to, when you finish, right, you want to, to compute and tabulate the posterior mean of its parameter given by this extremely simple formula. Look at this. This is the weighted average, right, with the weights being 1 over c plus 1 and c over c plus 1. So can you see now immediately the interpretation that c controls uh, the equivalence between prior measurements and real measurements? So one prior, prior measurement is equivalent to how many real measurements? Or, you know, if this is the whole sample, right, this is where all your data went, right? So you can see that one prior thing is equivalent to C times uh, uh, training data uh, sets, basically. Okay? So this is the variance, okay? Uh, and uh, if you use C equal to 1, you actually get a wonderful formula, surprise, surprise, that actually the posterior uh, of uh, beta is uh, the average of the MLE and, and the prior mean. And uh, I am going to, let me see, show you the table. So these are all the coefficients that you compute. This is the posterior means. This is the variances. And actually, in addition to that, I have uh, uh, tabulated here uh, this, uh, the log of the Bayes factors. I am going to tell you on Thursday how you compute them, repeating basically a previous lecture. But uh, uh, I'm going to give you a meaning, actually, in a second, OK? But I want you to look at this calculation. So this is the mean. This is the variance. And uh, can you remind me what's the biggest factor, by the way? So in the biggest factor, we are comparing two models, you remember? And it was the ratio of the marginal likelihoods of the two models. So here, I, it seems to me, I affiliate 
a biggest factor which with each of these variables uh, x1 x2 right and each of the coefficient so what do you think each of these biggest factor uh, represents what are the two models that each factor represents so let's concentrate on the biggest factor of this all right on for the intercept it has two models right i need two models to compare the biggest factors so what are the two models you think One model would be when that uh, uh, input is included in the model, so I have an intercept. And the other model is when, when I say I don't need it. So what's the purpose of, co of computing these biggest factors is to figure out, do you actually need to have that particular input in the model or not? And you remember now, so here uh, is the biggest factors. Uh, uh, does it say somewhere? OK. Uh, I, can you extrapolate actually it's the ratio for what so this stars mean that this is very important variable this is very important so can you tell me which models do I compare here which one is the on the is the ratio of two models what's on the numerator you remember the biggest factor here is greater you know uh, you know this is smaller so you know obviously this intercept needs to be there so I have the the ratio of the Vegas, uh, of the marginal likelihoods, where the first model is I'm including the parameter, and then on the bottom I have removed it. Okay, so you can see immediately from the calculation of the Vegas factors that these variables are extremely important. The rest of the variables you can get rid of them, and also this you can see it coincides with a non-Bayesian way. It's more or less the same. There is some ambiguity for some of these parameters, but at least. You see in a Bayesian fashion that these, uh, uh, you know, top five basically coefficients are extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, you may ask, you know, and how are we going to compute this? Well, you're going to have to compute the marginal likelihood, and we're going to compute analytically. So basically, in the computer code, you know, if you follow the notes or the chapter from the book, you will see a formula for the marginal likelihood and how it was computed, and this calculation, it becomes one line of a program. One line, literally, but it's going to be a very lengthy line with lots of terms. But at the end of the day, it's an amazing result because it allows you to do actually model selection and figure out uh, what input variables you need to keep in the model and which ones you need to throw out. Okay? Uh, so, um, so here it says evidence again says 0, 8, 0 is not to include the par particular parameters. Okay? And so the evidence is very strong uh, to keep this and less strong for the other two parameters. OK, uh, so this is, I copy the formulas. Um, uh, we play with the parameter C. So for C equal 100, this is what you get. Uh, for C equal 1,000, this is what you get. And actually, let me see. Let's look at some results. This is 10 and 6. Uh, 10 and 6, so they seem, you know, uh, more reasonable than before, okay? Uh, but we will do better because we will, we will get rid of C. And the way we will get rid of C is by assuming some prior on C and then uh, integrating C out. And we will do this on, uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, can you actually, uh, for this model, can you actually get a predicted distribution? You basically, it's the same calculation as the one that I did before. You can cut and paste the formulas and adjust them to this uh, Zellner's G prior. And uh, 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 there is the answers. Uh, so basically, the predictive distribution, we see if there is a formula. Uh, come on. So the predictive distribution, uh, all right, so uh, I don't want the intermediate results. I want the final result, OK? All right, so I, uh, I, I am lost now, OK? So uh, basically, in the predicted distribution, this is what you need to compute, OK? And uh, this, was, uh, 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 this involves uh, uh, integration of sigma squared. So this comes to be a Gaussian, all right? Uh, and so this has to be a skewed t distribution. And I think the formulas are basically adaptation of the formulas that I already gave you before, OK? And, uh, uh, so here you see the results of the conditional uh, posterior 
predicted distribution given sigma squared. That's the posterior mean. And uh, here's the variance. And I'm actually using that trick that I told you before, right? Given sigma squared, uh, the conditional means and variance are easier to compute. So you know you can write the predictive uh, variance of curly y given sigma squared like that. All right? So that's a Gaussian. And uh, with that Gaussian in place, you plug it in here. You integrate uh, this distribution that is actually trivial because it's a Jeffries prior 1 over sigma squared. And, uh, and then you're done. All right? Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to finish there, right? And I'm going to come back on this on, on, uh, to continue on Thursday. Uh, the individual parameters, basically beta that you get, OK, with sigma squared integrated out, there are student t distributions. OK? And you remember uh, on, the, uh, on the beginning of the lecture, I told you that the non-Bayesian way to get error bars on, uh, on the parameters beta is to use these t statistics. So actually, you know what? Uh, if we do some smart selection of the prior parameters on this, we can force this to give us the same results from this statistic as the non-Bayesian way. So basically, you can discover uh, things that uh, don't have fundamental uh, sort of uh, origin in uh, non-Bayesian statistics, but with proper selection of uh, uh, priors, basically, uh, we can drop this uh, t distribution to take the form uh, of some common results that uh, we compute with um, uh, non bayesian fashion. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop there, right? Uh, th this part of the, of the homework is a very exciting sort of uh, little activity at the end where not only we're going to be computing which model is the best, but we're going to develop a framework uh, that we're going to be sampling over models. So we're going to 